Good morning, everyone. Oh, that's nice and loud. And welcome to our spiritual gathering this morning. We gather in gratitude this morning on treaty land, a treaty signed between the government and the settlers of Canada and the indigenous people who lived here as First Nations. We are all treaty people. We seek a new relationship with the original peoples of this land, one based in honor and in deep respect. We gather as a spiritual community this morning of the United Church of Canada here in South Minster Steiner United Church to be in fellowship together, to sing together, to pray together, to hear stories of faith and words of wisdom that have been handed down to us from early Jewish and Christian communities and from other ancient and contemporary men and women, and to reflect on what those stories might mean for us in our time and in our place. Let's open ourselves to being here with the words of our gathering song, Let Us Build a House. Who join together in these words. On life's path of discovery, we continue to learn who we are as we're invited to speak the truth of ourselves. May we open to each other. May our stories be heard and intertwine to become a tale of who we are together, how we wish to live exemplify what is important, celebrate 
what is sacred to us. In the telling of our stories, may new ones be created that tell of our potential, our importance, our impact. As we continue to journey, may we find our truer and more complete selves as those who walk in support of one another in the spirit of love. Amen. So the time for all ages this morning, do you want to come and listen up here? Just have a seat on the carpet and Chris is going to sit with you. So a time for all ages this morning is a fable by somebody named Aesop, or Aesop, what would you call him? Aesop, okay. It's called The Dog and the Bone. Crossing a bridge with a bone in his teeth, a dog stopped to stare at the river beneath. And what did he see in that watery shine? There's a dog right below with a bone just like mine. If I could get that bone, then I would have two, a much nicer number on which I can chew. He snatched for that second, but opened his mouth his barks all flew northward, and his bone went south. <laughs> it splashed in the river, quite dousing our hero. It vanished. He slunk home, a bone count of zero. <laughs> this is an old story told for generations.
I share with you another old, old story. This is the, this is the myth of Narcissus. Narcissus was handsome. He attracted many nymphs, all of whom he briefly entertained before scorning and refusing them. One day while out enjoying the sunshine, Narcissus came upon a pool of water. As he gazed into it, he caught a glimpse of what he thought was a beautiful water spirit. He did not recognize his own reflection and was immediately enamored. A beautiful face, eyes wide and curving lips and a noble nose, so beautiful that it caught his breath. Narcissus bent down his head to kiss the vision. As he did so, the reflection mimicked his actions. Taking this as a sign that the spirit felt the same way, Narcissus reached into the pool to draw the water spirit to him. The water was displaced in the ripples and the vision was gone. He panicked. Where was his love? When the water became calm, the spirit returned. Why, beautiful being, do you shun me? Surely my face is not one to repel you. The nymphs love me and you yourself look not indifferent upon me. When I stretch forth my arms, you do the same and you smile upon me and answer my beckonings with delight. And again he reached out and again his love disappeared. And so frightened to touch the water, Narcissus lay still by the pool, gazing into the eyes of his vision. He cried in frustration. He didn't move. He didn't eat. He didn't drink. He would never love another. He only suffered. And as he pined, he became gaunt, losing his beauty. The nymphs that loved him pleaded with him to come away from the pool, but he was too transfixed. He wanted to stay there forever. Narcissus died there of grief. His body disappeared. And where his body once lay, a flower grew. And in this place, the nymphs mourned his death. This is a mythological story that has endured. May we find wisdom for our living. From James 1, verses 22 to 25. Be doers of the world, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word, and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and, on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the truth, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, that person will find delight and affirmation in their action. These are the words from the early Jesus tradition. May we find wisdom for our living.
I want to start with another story this morning. This is the story of the principal of a junior high school who had a problem with a few of the older girls using lipstick. They would uh, apply lipstick in the bathroom and then a few of them would press their lips to the mirror and leave lip prints all over the school mirrors. Every night the custodian would remove them and the next day the girls would put them back. And finally the principal decided that something had to be done to stop this. So he called the girls in, told them that she wanted to meet with them in the ladies room at 2 p.m. They gathered there, found the principal and the school custodian waiting for them and their lecture. The principal explained that this was becoming a problem for the custodian to clean the mirror every night and she said she felt the girls didn't fully understand how much of a problem it was to remove this waxy lipstick off the mirror. So the custodian was going to demonstrate just how hard it was. So he took his brush, dipped it in the nearest toilet and cleaned the mirror. And since then, there have been no more lip prints (laughs) on the mirror. (laughs) We have have a love-hate relationship with mirrors. We love to hate them. We don't ever fully like what we see in them. And we also hate to love them. Because most of us can't resist just one last look as we go out the door. Are we presentable? Is everything okay? Just what do we do with that image that stares back at us in the mirror? Do we trust what it says to us? Do we use it to help us discern who we are? Do we reject it as vanity? or find some middle ground or some compromise in coexisting peacefully with these blasted things in all of our houses. Today we shared three stories about mirrors, four if you count the silly lipstick one. In the first one, the Greek myth of Narcissus, we we read a cautionary tale about the power of being overtaken by the power of our own selves, our own concerns, our own visions. Given a little praise, we all start to believe it. It's what our egos long to do, to start believing the hype that everyone says. Or to look down at our, uh, to look at our own accomplishments, maybe our own thoughts, maybe our own beliefs, maybe the way we do things, and to fall victim to the deceitful voice that tells us that our way is really the best. If only everyone else would do it our way, there'd be no problems. There's a little narcissus in every one of us our ego wishing to overtake us and inviting us with the tempting vision of a world reflecting the ease, the beauty, if it were just our thoughts, our ways, our ideas. And rightfully so, the name narcissistic goes with it. Perhaps none of us have suffered as long or as hard as Narcissus did, or as fatally. But each of us recognizes the sidetrack of losing ourselves in the deep lonely pool of self-focus. That deep and long and isolated stare into our own concerns. It really only takes one or two bad twists and turns in our lives. It only takes One circumstance, one thing that we mourn or person, 
one tricky challenge in our life. And it's amazing how quick we are sidetracked by being obsessed with our own struggles and our own challenges. That that twist, that turn, that challenge, that mourning is all there is. It's all that matters. And it's all we can think about. So it may not be our own reflection and the beauty of it that loses our stare. But we're wrong to laugh at Narcissus and the tale that it tells because we're distracted and sidetracked and allured by ourselves in so many ways. This poor dog, the poor dog who looks at a reflection and sees a dog with a bigger bone, how appealing that must look. And upon grasping for it, loses the bone she does have. Beyond its surface meaning that cautions against greed, the beauty of this fable is in its reminder to us of the risk of believing exactly what we see. How do we know what we see is accurate? Is our mirror reflecting a true image of what is what? Or is it one of these? Is it one of these funhouse mirrors that shows us distorted images of what we might look like? Or is it the kind of mirrors that look normal, but they're the kind we find in the fitting rooms, and that everything looks good there, <laughs> until we get it home in the real light, How do we know what to believe anymore? Or is it, the kind of, is it the kind of mirror like that's when you pick up your spoon and look in the back of it? It turns everything on its head. Which shall we trust? Shall we, like Narcissus, believe that the reflection shining back is beautiful? Shall we ignore all else in the pursuit of a goal that's so off course that we would waste our time and energy, all because we've seen it inaccurately? Shall we, like the dog, believe that we aren't quite good enough and deceive ourselves that way, that happiness and fulfillment will happen only if we just get that other bone, only if we get that next step at work, that better job, that perfect relationship, that son that calls for Pete's sake, the family that appreciates our efforts just once or maybe just two days in a row. We can make ourselves believe that happiness and fulfillment is just one grasp away. It's tricky business looking in mirrors. Not only do we have to ask ourselves, can we trust this mirror? Can we trust the reflection that we see there? But we have to recognize and wonder, not just like Narcissus and the dogs, but like all of us humans have to wonder about what it who it is that's looking back at us in these mirrors. It's far too easy for us to recognize the sidetrack of losing ourselves in the noise and believing whatever is held out in front of us in not seeing it for what it is, for whatever someone wants to sell us, a mere reflection of our own insecurities. Uh-oh, technology. The third piece of wisdom comes from a letter that challenges us to look, 
to look at our, our lofty words and our fancy things that we say and believe. And, and wonder how they match up with the real life of what we're doing, how we're being, how we're acting. James uh, has this little tiny book in the Christian writings. And um, the book almost didn't get included in the Bible when, when the Bible was being uh, created. Many thought it's just a, just a bit of light fluff. Actually, though, uh, the author of this book is clearly pressing for a more practical understanding of what it means to be a, a Christian person. Because it's not full of fancy words, necessarily. Uh, the challenge of this text that the writer wants to convey is to make sure that our spirituality is more than concepts. It's more than pronouncements of how good we think we are. That the spiritual journey includes real effort and dirty hands and an abundance of compassion. From the first chapter of James, be doers of the word and not just hearers. If you just hear words and don't act on them, you're like a person who upon going away from a mirror immediately forgets what they look like. Forgets who they are and what they stand for. So it's the action of our lives that reinforces and helps us remember who we are. I think that's James's point in this in, in, in this in this uh, reading. That it's easy to forget words. It's easy to forget the things that we believe about ourselves. It's much harder to forget our actions. Words are cheap, but we tend to remember the things we do and the things that are done for and with us. So in our actions, do we not reinforce then what we stand for, what we speak about, who we stand with? It's, it's all about what we do. To leave the mirror and forget who we are is, is really the anti-narcissus, right? It's the opposite end of the spectrum. It's not being lost in the reflection. It's being lost because you forget. If we're to take the little sideways glance before we dash out the door and then forget who we are, we run the distinct risk of being lost in the roar, in the busyness of a culture that will suck everything up like a giant tornado, including all the unique power and the unique beauty and the unique value that we bring to the world. Each of us has that inside of us. We light this candle every week to remind us of that light, that sacredness that's within each of us. And we all run the risk of running out the door and forgetting it. Because that's just who we are. It's just the way it is. But the author of James recognizes that the one solution for that is to not rely just on our thoughts and our ideas about who we are. That we use the cheap words, but that we go and we just do it. We just start living it. The, the great risk lies in the fact that should we lose who we really are, the mirror always demands something. That's the thing with mirrors. It has to reflect something, unless there's any vampires in the room. So we end up reflecting the masks of who we think we're supposed to be. Or mindlessly wearing the masks that will gain us approval. Then by the time we wake up to what is happening, our pretending has become second nature. 
That's what happens when you wear a mask. That's what happens when we pretend so that people will like us or approve or so we'll fit in. The problem is the mask becomes our real face after a while. Again, we leave the mirror, we forget who we are. The desire for approval is insatiable in any case. Once you decide you need it, you seek it out like a drug. One day you look around, wherever you're at, work, school, home, church, neighborhood, species, and you realize that you've lost yourself in the crowd. So whichever way the story goes, whether it's self-absorption on, on one side or self-carelessness on the other, we can't remember and see ourselves accurately if it's just me, myself, and I looking in the mirror all alone. There are so many problems with our mirrors, we need each other to help one another out. It's, it's, it's much better to ask a friend if these pants make my legs look fat than it is to, for me to answer that in the mirror by myself because I know what I'm going to say. That's why we need people that love us gently, though, to answer that question, too. <laughs> the answer is always no, right? <laughs> One way to start is the way suggested to us by those spiritual communities long ago. I think if, if you think you want to be a certain kind of person, the wisdom seems to say, just start acting like it. Those who persevere in acting according to the truth of love, freedom, compassion, will find their actions, will find their meaning, will find it affirmed, will find others joining in. That's the wisdom of James. Those who persevere in acting according to the truth of love and freedom and compassion will find themselves confirmed in it and joined by others in it. So my reading of that says that I should stop probably asking the questions in the mirror and of my loved ones and putting them in awkward positions to answer, no dear, you look fine. And I should stop doing that, and I should say that I'm just going to go and start acting, start behaving, start treating the others in my life in the way that I need to, that makes me the person I need to be and want to be. That's the only mirror that I will be able to trust is in the actions that we work on together. The actions of love and freedom and compassion, as James wrote. So I'm thinking that for me, there's no better day than today to reclaim an authentic life, to begin expanding the inventory of mirrors in my house, to measure our life according to more than shoulds and supposed tos, And look around and remember that I'm not alone, and that none of us are alone, and indeed, we're part of something larger than ourselves. It's, it's the me reflected by the world. So actually, we could all do a lot worse than be a house of mirrors. Because that's a place where love is shared and truth is told and beauty is becoming in the work of community. So we'll try our best to walk that middle path. Narcissus way over there, the dog way, and the bone way over there, we'll walk this middle path that says, let's just get on with doing with each other. 
and in that we'll see reflected the world we hope to build. May we bless each other in its doing, and may it be so, together, in so many ways. As we go today, we're invited, as always, to go that our lives might be a reflection of what we value, that our actions might reflect the love and the peace that we speak about, that our lives and our relationships might reflect the compassion and kindness of which we read about and discuss. As we go from this place, may the actions we take with those around us be the kind of world we want to create. May we go reflecting all that is good and valuable and loving. May we go with a song on our lips. <laughs> 